Good morning. Welcome to Parks Church. My name is Eric Ashley. I'm one of the pastors here. Somebody will grab the folks outside and come, uh, direct them to come on in. We'll go ahead and get started here this morning. Grateful to see uh, faces here in person this morning. Also grateful if you're joining us uh, online later for, for different reasons and worshiping there. Um, grateful to have you as well. Just a couple of announcements here as we get started. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, welcome. We are obviously meeting in a high, uh, elementary school cafeteria uh, for, for this season of, of our life. I'm happy to say we have signed a lease, and I just got the key handed to me by Katie. We have a, we have a building uh, that we're going to be moving towards. You've uh, received some updates if you're part of our uh, email list and that kind of stuff. Um, if not, grab uh, one of the officers, especially Scott Lane, ask him any questions you have about the building. He's raising his hand by there getting coffee. Um, or, or me or John or anybody. But we, um, we, uh, if you're visiting with us, one way you can find out about that information and other stuff that's going on in the life of the church and the community is to fill out a Connect card. We'll put you on our email list. And, uh, and you get weekly updates of things that are going on that you can look through and find the appropriate information that applies to you. Or you can download our Park Church app and just uh, follow along there with the things that are going on. It's an easy way to, to look at the services uh, back or to give or, or anything else there. Um, we do have a lunch today after the service for th- folks that are interested in church membership or finding out more about the church. It's going to be at the Ashley home. If you haven't, let me know uh, that you want to come. Just come up after the service and let me know about that so we'll know, know and make sure we have plenty of food prepared. We're going to uh, meet on our, our back porch, uh, and I can tell you where that's at, and we're going to have lunch together and talk through things to deal with the church, and we'll receive some, uh, hopefully some new members here in a couple weeks, which is exciting. Uh, we do have an adult Sunday school class, or just a Sunday school class that's going on called God, How God Changes Us in the library on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. Uh, if you haven't made the first couple weeks, that's okay. There's four more left, and you can jump in anytime there uh, and, and join with others in a, a healthy discussion about how God changes us. Uh, And then the last announcement I want to let you know about is we have um, an opportunity to support another community event coming up, the West Park Trick or Treat, uh, this this Thursday night. And so uh, down at West Park, uh, there's going to be tables and treats and all sorts of things going on. Uh, Jump in there. If you want to know details with that, you can talk to Katie or Taylor back there at the information desk, and they can tell you any details going on with that. Did I miss anything? Any other announcements? All right. we are in, towards the end actually, only got a few more weeks left of a series on the book of Hebrews, which is a book in the New Testament that we've been studying through. Today we're going to talk about this idea, we've been talking about the idea that Jesus is better. Uh, we've been pressing into the person and work of Jesus, and um, we're going to talk about how Jesus is a better sacrifice. The Old Testament has a whole sacrificial system that if you go back and read the Old Testament, you can read about. And uh, the, the author of Hebrews, the preacher there, makes, a, makes his argument today in chapter 9 of how Jesus is a better sacrifice. So just as we get ready to enter into the worship of God, which is no small thing, just take just a few seconds before John comes up to prepare your heart for worship. Please stand as we greet God and one another using the words on the screen. Friends, may the Lord be with you. Our soul waits for the Lord. For our heart is glad in him. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us. Uh, What kind of God makes the hearts of his followers glad? Let's pray to him now. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, help us in this service of worship to trust in you in such a way that it results in gladness of heart, that you would receive the sacrifice of thanksgiving from us, that we would leave here grateful and joyful and changed, having been convinced and having seen and experienced the supremacy of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Good morning. How are you guys doing? 
Let's, uh, let's sing to the Lord this morning.
One of the things we talked about in our Sunday morning class this morning was that uh, we tend to say to ourselves and to each other, shame on you. But Jesus enters in, like we just sang, and says, no, 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 shame off you. And so you don't have to hide your sin anymore. You don't have to harbor your failures. And you don't have to harden your heart when you hear my truth, says Jesus. Just come to me. Lay it down before me. And find healing. That's why we come and confess each week as a people together. God calls us to do that with these words from Psalm 34 this morning. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Friends, this promise is for you and me. Let's pray this prayer of confession together. Almighty Father, God of gods and Lord of lords, Father to the fatherless, husband to the widow, defender of the helpless, judge of all the earth, have mercy on us. We have not sought freedom for the oppressed, even though you freed us. We have not bound up the broken, even though you healed us. We have not forgiven others, even though you forgave us. We withhold kindness from the needy, even though you freely gave us your own son. We are without excuse, but not without hope. By your power and grace, account our sins to Jesus and amend our ways by the power of his glorious resurrection. We pray in his powerful name. Amen. Let's continue in a season of confession and let this song guide our hearts. Forgiveness was born. 
This is the good news that makes Christianity Christianity. Forgiveness, the forgiveness that you and I need, was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You don't have to earn it. In fact, you can't. So then how do you get it? You just turn to him in faith. Christ Jesus, what you paid for with your blood, let it be upon me. That's all you have to do. And here are these words of assurance from Psalm 33. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Turn to Jesus, who has purchased the forgiveness you need, and the steadfast love of God comes upon you forever. That is good news. Let's respond. People of God, lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Tenderness, he saw me so we can sit with him.
God, we're so grateful, so grateful for your seeking love, that you don't leave us in our sins, that you don't uh, turn your back forever, but you sent your son, Jesus, you came and accomplished salvation. Holy Spirit, you come even now to apply that to our hearts, to make it real to us. Change us from having been with you, we pray in Jesus' strong name, amen. You may be seated and Kids that are headed to your lesson can come meet your leaders up front. We'll pray for you guys and for us and our time in God's word. Come line up up here and we'll say a quick prayer before you leave. All right. Now let's pray. God, we love these little ones. We're so grateful for them in our midst. Um, Pray for them now as they have a lesson that is appropriate for them and their age. We pray that you would be their teacher, Holy Spirit. You'd minister to them in the same way. We pray the same for us. You would open our hearts to receive wonderful things from your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As they head back to their lesson, take just a moment to say hi to someone around you, and we'll get started here with the sermon in just a second. Right. You can grab your coffee or whatever you need and grab a seat. We'll go ahead and get started. If you have Bibles or Bible apps or anything like that, uh, turn or scroll to uh, Hebrews chapter 9 is where we'll be this morning. Again, we've only got uh, probably four more weeks or so before we finish this series and then head into Advent. It's hard to believe we're almost at that season, but 
We're about a month or so away, so I'm sure you've already seen the Christmas trees and those things up in Home Depot and, and Lowe's. We're already getting ready. Um, we'll be reading just a portion of Hebrews chapter 9 instead of the whole chapter, but if you have a chance later on today, I encourage you to go back and read the whole chapter. You'll get better, a better sense, even in chapter 10, of this idea of sacrifice and what we're going to be referencing in our, our time together today. Let me invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I'm going to start in chapter 9, verse 23, and read through verse 28. This is what it says. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But, as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to, be, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. A little over a decade ago, a pastor named John Piper was preaching in Nashville to a, collect, a collection, a gathering of, um, of counselors, of Christian counselors. And uh, if, you, if you go back and, uh, and Google it and find the, the, the talk online, um, it's, he said it's the weirdest, most unnerving time and message and, and, and sermon of his life. Because what happens as Piper gets started, um, he's, he's trying to be transparent. He's trying to share with them, uh, again, a collection, a group, a gathering of counselors. He's trying to be transparent. And he's trying to say, this is who you're dealing with up here. And he starts to slowly uh, say things like, uh, I'm a sinner. And as he starts off and says, I'm a sinner, the response from the gathering is laughter. He says, I'm a sinner, and they all erupt in laughter. And then he says, he stops a second, he says, well, let me go further. And he starts to name different things about himself, trying to be transparent, that is, is vulnerable. Is, hey, I, I suffer from wanting to be approved and have the approval of men and women. And again, erupting, erupting of laughter. And he's, he looks kind of bewildered and, and a little unsettled, and he goes on one by one. And finally, about eight or nine things into his confession, and with, and each one met with louder and louder laughter, he says, I am absolutely confused right now. And again, laughter. And he's like, no, no, I'm serious. Why are you laughing? Please stop laughing. I'm trying to be serious. And again, laughter. And he says it's the most bewildering, bewildering time he's ever experienced, and as he goes back and looks and tries to reflect on what was happening, he can't still quite put his finger on it. But what he attributes it to was that they were at this gathering of, of, of counselors and that the program up until the point that he'd come up to, to speak had been a, one that was set to set people at ease. To say, hey, you're going to learn some stuff here this week, but let's also have fun. Let's also enjoy each other. And... He attributes it to a culture of when speakers usually speak, they usually start off with what? A joke, right? They want to lighten everybody up, break the tension in the room and that kind of stuff. So they just assumed that's what he was doing. If you know anything about John Piper, uh, he, he tends to get serious really quickly, right? And so here he is trying to be serious, but he's speaking into a context that is not able and not ready to hear it. And so it's met with a totally um, unwarranted and unbefitting response. Um, if we were to come this morning and just dive in to Hebrews chapter 9 and into chapter 10, to the Old Testament sacrificial system, to blood, to the sacrifice of animals, and to talk about and try to talk about how Jesus is our better sacrifice, it might be be, we might be tempted to be kind of like that other setting in the sense of we would come and we'd say, oh, that was interesting. Learn something about Old Testament sacrificial system. But we've got to understand the right backdrop 
of what this letter is speaking to, this sermon that was preached to these people, and even the whole context of maybe even the backdrop of our lives, of the world, of the reality that we live in, in order to even begin to get a sense of what's actually being said here and why it matters. So um, let's try to do that for just a moment before we actually dive into the text and pull something from it. And, and here's, here's the backdrop. Um, the backdrop is sin. The backdrop is a sinful and broken and messed up world. So let's talk about that just for a moment before we jump in uh, and, and get a sense of it. Sin is rebellion. Uh, it might be even better to start, before we even talk about sin, to think of sin first as evil, as betrayal, as, as corruption, as devastation, as violence. Those are just a few of the words the Bible uses in talking about what sin is and what is done to this world. And it's not just evil and betrayal and corruption and devastation and violence, but it's all of those things, knowingly or unknowingly, in opposition, put forth in opposition to the person and plan of the living God. So it's not just evil in general, or corruption in general, or betrayal in general, but it's evil against and set against God, his person and his plan. Betrayal of him, corruption of the things that he has made and loves, devastation and violence against the things that he holds dear and has different plans for. Someone has said it this way, sin is a parasite, a parasite, something that, that latches itself on to us in the good things that God has created. In the same way that darkness can really only be explained as the absence of light, right? The only way to really understand darkness is, well, it's, it's, it's where light is absent. In the same way, sin is really only understood as attaching itself to and distorting and marring something beautiful that God has made, whether us or his world. So sin in and of itself is irrational. It doesn't make sense. It had no place in God's world, but it entered in through the rebellion of mankind and attached itself to every part of God's beautiful and good creation. Since the rebellion of humans' first representatives, sin has infected every single area of creation and every single area of our lives. I'm in a Tuesday morning group with a, a group of guys, and, and any of you are welcome to, to join us there. But um, we, we're studying through this book called Broken Down House by Paul Tripp. Listen to some of these things he asked at the first of, his cha of, of chapter 2. He says, is there anything that is it's disappointing you right now? Is there a relationship or a situation that's leaving you hurt or confused? Are there personal problems you simply have not been able to solve? Do you feel alienated or alone or misunderstood? Have you had to deal with mistreatment or injustice lately? Have you been hurt? Are you angry? Are you fearful? Are you discouraged? Is there any place in your life where you feel like giving up or giving in? Does your life seem so much more complicated than it should be? Do you seem like you're having to deal with obstacles of one or another? And then he yeah, he asks later on in the chapter, he says, Do you regularly face difficulties which you, you sought to solve, but which still lie open and festering? Have you in the, envied somebody else's life? Have you ever wished you could start over in some area of, your, area of your life, but you know you can't? Have you ever felt too weak, too unqualified to deal with what's confronting you? Does your life seem to move too fast for you to ever be able to catch up? And then he goes on to say, That's because... We live in a world that is like a broken down house. Every area has been affected and infected by sin. Now, not great news, right, to start off the message today. But what we do when we see those sorts of truths laid out before us or experienced in our own lives is we begin to ask questions like this. Why doesn't a good God just rid the world of evil? I mean, that would be and seem like something that would be a good thing for a good God to do, right? Well, it's because we have a problem. And the problem is that evil isn't just out there for us to evaluate and experience, but it's most especially in here, that we're actually the ones that produce it. We're the reason that things are wrong in the world. So if God were to rid the world of evil, he'd have to rid the world of us. 
We don't just live in a polluted world. We are the ones who pollute it because our hearts are polluted. And everything we do ushers forth from those polluted hearts. That's the backdrop of Hebrews chapters 9 and 10. The backdrop of sin-sick people living in a sin-sick world in which every area has been touched in some sort of way. So two points today. Not three. Two points today. That's right. Blowing your minds. And they're this. We've got two great needs that we see from this chapter. And we see a two-staged plan. Two great needs and a two-staged plan. So I went with the twos and just did two points. All right. Two great needs, you see. The two great needs are the need for access and the need for cleansing. Go back. Read Hebrews 1 through where we are today. And you will see this theme of access, of wanting the presence, needing the presence of God, of feeling alone and abandoned, and the feeling of needing cleansing. Let's talk, let's take access first. Um, what we want, what we need, what we don't know that we've lost is this sense of unrestricted access to God. What we feel on a day to day basis because of our sin, because what comes out of our hearts and our mouths and our hands. And the world that we experience on a day-to-day basis is what we feel. We feel distance. We feel alienation. We feel like we've lost access to God and even to one another in some sense of way. It, it, you know, the, one of the, the best tricks of the evil one is to make us feel like we're the only ones going through anything. We feel isolated and lonely and discouraged. And, and, and it's easy to do that because our sin by itself in the world creates distance and alienation from God and from others. And the reason that's so is because there's a creation reality behind that, which was that we were created to be in full, open access to the presence of God. And then to, in that presence, to relate rightly, to enter into one another's lives in openness and without shame, without hiding, without a distance, without alienation in any sort of way of conflict, but true intimate relationships with one another. That's what we were created for and had full access to God and one another when he made us. But when sin entered the world, it ruined that. And it, it creates this distance and alienation. So as you go back and look, and it's detailed in, in very, very good detail, in, in ch- starting in chapter 9 where it talks about all of these things that God put in place so that people could come to God. And have access to them. And so you see that there's this, this tabernacle, which eventually became the temple. And in the tabernacle, there's outer courts, and there's inner courts, and then there's the most holy of holies inner court. And that, you know, different people could have different access to different courts, even though sinful they were, they, they were by doing certain things, certain practices ceremonially that would allow them further and closer access. But only one high priest once a year could represent the people and get actually into the the good stuff, the glory of God, the holy of holies, where he would make atonement for the people. So even then, in the system that God set up, there was this limited, difficult access that created a sense of distance and alienation from God and one another. So that's one great need. Secondly, we see a need for cleansing. And not just cleansing, but a cleansing that lasts. Now we feel this because of our sin when we feel and experience what John mentioned a while ago that you discussed, some of you, in your Sunday school class this morning. The sense of guilt and shame. Or we might call it, in relation to this, this a sense of we, we have been stained. And we can't get that stain out. And we carry it with us everywhere we go because of our sin. And we know it. And we're just trying to hide it and cover it up for nobody else to see it. And the truth is they know it too because they are carrying the same kind of stain in their own hearts. And that was not the way, way it's supposed to be. The reason we feel that is there's a creation reality that undergirds that. Where there was complete innocence before God. Where you didn't have to hide as God would come walking through the cool of the day. But you could go and meet with him without a sense of guilt or shame. Because it was a sinless world. There had been no sin created. There had been no sin that had, had, had been occur- occurred or committed in the world. And so in the Old Testament, you see this sense of uh, structures, of systems that are put in place, not just so you could have access, but so that you could be clean. 
you, be, you could be clean or cleansed, forgiven for your sin. Um, but instead of it being something that was easy to do, it was difficult. It was a, a major process. And then it was, you had to do it over and over because the cleansing didn't last. It was temporary. As soon as you went and sinned again, as you're leaving the temple that you were just sacrificed sin for, you go and you, you sin again. And so now this repeated. We've got to do it all over again. Now, two great needs, access and cleansing, unrestricted access and cleansing that lasts. We're going to talk about how God dealt with those needs, but let me just make a couple of applications before we leave this idea. Um, when we think about these great needs of wanting access, needing access to God, to experience His presence in a right way, and, and to be clean in His presence, to have our, our, our sins dealt with and forgiven, just know that as you enter the world this week, there's going to be this tension in your life. And that's, it's described in, in, here in this passage for us and in many other passages of Scripture that there's this tension of expectation and yearning that you will, if you see the world rightly, if you, have the, if you put on the lens of Scripture, if you, if you look at it rightly, you'll see this tension of expectation and yearning. So as you walk out of your house and your car doesn't crank or Somebody says something mean before you've had your coffee and are awake enough to take it, and you take huge offense, and there's been a shouting match before you leave the house. Or you get to school, kids, and your teacher's in a bad mood, and she unjustly punishes you for something that you didn't deserve. Or you, as a teacher, have your kids come do something in your class that they shouldn't have done that sends things in a tailspin for them. Those are to be what this passage is saying expected. Those aren't something that should be surprising. In some ways, we don't live the world as a glass half empty people, but we live with these glasses of reality where we see things of like, yes, that makes total sense in a world that is sin sick and in my heart that is sin sick. So you've got this expectation that sees the world rightly. And at the same time, you have this yearning, this yearning for, hey, I know that's not how it was created. I know that's not how things are supposed to be. And for those of us that have trusted in Jesus, we know there's something else working there that we yearn to not be this way, to not lose it on my kids, to not have my car break down or whatever it might be on and on and on through the day. So there's this expectation and yearning, and that is the tension that we will live with until Jesus comes back, which is spoken of at the end of this passage we just read. We'll talk about it in a moment more. That's the expectation and the tension that we live with. And secondly, so does everybody else. Everybody else in the world is living with that same reality, whether they acknowledge it or not. And so we've got an unbelievable bridge to our friends and neighbors built in. They suffer. Hey, so do we. They have this happen to them. Hey, so do we. We have this thing going on on our side of, side of us, this tension, this yearning. So do they. We have in common with every other person that God has put in our life the sense that we live in a broken world, in a world that's not the way it's supposed to be, and with hearts that don't do the things that we want them to do. So it's a great chance for us to say, you know what, that's true. And I just heard my pastor on Sunday actually talk about that. Let me tell you what he said. What do you think about that? And to have this unbelievable bridge to a, a real relationship to talk about the things of the Lord. Christians should be the, the, the most clear realist of anybody else that can just not shy away from the hard things of the world, but say, oh yeah, that makes total sense with what I know, what the Bible tells me. And let me tell you, that's not the end of the story. So let's go there now. It's not the end of the story. Not only do we see two great needs, but we see a two-staged plan here, a two-staged plan. Let me get at it this way. N.T. Wright has a great illustration that um, would help me in, in processing some of this. And he talks about it in the sense he, he visited Boston one year uh, for a speaking engagement. And at that point in the city's history, they were redoing their whole road system where they were putting a main highway that would go from the outside of the city, go straight into the heart of the city. But to do that, as you know, in any sort of city construction, what do they do? Well, they build all sorts of alternative routes and roads, right, that are meant to be temporary so that they can do construction on the main 
thoroughfare that they're trying to make to make things easier. Well, now what happens while they build all of those side roads and side structures and they're doing construction? What happens in the city? Everything slows down. Everything's more difficult. Even though a way has been made for the temporary getting around the city while this road is being constructed, there's a way that's made, but it's difficult. It's far more difficult than it has to be, and it slows everything's, everything down and makes it complicated. That is what, that's how he describes what's going on with the Old Testament sacrificial system. That there were these Old Testament sacrificial rituals which were, were good. They were helpful, right? They were just not complete. They were not supposed to be, um, they were supposed to be temporary. They were supposed to help things work, help people have access to God and cleansing while the road was built for us to go straight to the heart of God again, which happened in Jesus. So those are the two-stage plan that is described in chapters 9 and 10, this Old Testament sacrificial rituals and then the mind-bending final sacrifice accomplished by Jesus. Let's talk about those for just a minute. The Old Testament rituals of sacrifice were all about access and cleansing. First of all, we see that we, we see this atonement through sacrifice. Um, you can go study. There's some great tools out there. One of my favorite, because I'm a simple-minded person, is these animated cartoon videos that the Bible Project has made on YouTube. You go re- you watch those, and you're like, oh, that's an unbelievable hard concept. And y'all just made it and put it on my level. I can see the drawings and how it all fits together. There's one on sacrifice and atonement. It's really helpful. But it's this idea of there's a life for a life. Because of my sin... Because of of what I've done, I need to be forgiven. I need to have my sin dealt with. But sadly, my sin doesn't just affect me. It affects everybody else around me. It affects the world around me. So not only does, does my sin have to be dealt with, but the effects and the devastation and the stain that I've spread to other parts and other people in my life and other parts of the world in which I live, that needs to be taken care of as well. So there was this system set up. So we would come... And we, if maybe it had been a, a, a full bull day, right? And we're bringing a bull to be sorry. Or maybe it's been a, a turtle dove day or whatever it might be. But we're making atonement for our sins. And it was a messy process. You can imagine. I mean, these priests, I tend to think of them as, you know, these you know, kind of, uh, you know, not manly men, but man, people wearing these things that don't want to get dirty and that kind of stuff. It's the opposite. And they're the butcher. They're getting out their knives. You're bringing them the sacrifice, and they are slaughtering it right there. And they're taking it and they're chopping it up and they're doing all this kind of stuff and they're arranging it on the altar and the blood flowed. Can you imagine coming home after doing that job for the day and the stains that are forever on your hands and arms and everywhere else? From getting down and dirty to the sacrifice that you're having to make for different people coming up. That's why there was a whole tribe given over to this process because it took a whole tribe of people just to take care of and handle the amount of sacrifice that was offered on a day-to-day basis as the blood flowed and the sacrifices were offered to take care of people's sin. And then in addition to that, they take some of the blood and then different parts in this in the tabernacle and the temple, they take it and they'd sprinkle it. And you see the sprinkling of blood all over the place in the Old Testament. What were they doing? Well they're saying, hey, it doesn't just affect you. It, the pollution is spread throughout, so every time there's a sprinkling of blood, there's a, 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 the picture is wherever it touches is cleansing. Life is being poured out and sprinkled to cover the death that has been seeping out because of our sin. Very vivid. Now, why? Why was it so vivid? Why did they have to smell and see and touch all of this kind of stuff? Because God's trying to communicate to us, to them and to us, that's how bad your sin is. That's what it takes to deal with your rebellion and the corruption and the devastation and the violence that is inside you and that is spreading throughout the world. That's how bad it is. That's how significant it is. You have to do this to, to find the access and the cleansing that you want. I've stained the world. I need a representative. I, the only way I can be clean is a life for my life. He dies, the animal dies, so that I don't have to. That's how significant and serious it is. So, when Jesus comes on the scene, 
Again, verses 26 and 27 say it. He, Jesus would have had to rep- suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. What is it saying? He broke the mold. He was not just the priest that came to make a a great sacrifice. Because then you'd have to find a sacrifice that's worth covering everything. He was actually the priest and the victim. And the sacrifice. He was the only one that could come and offer a pure, unblemished life that could be offered in exchange for not just one of us, but all of us. And so he came, in the sacrificial system all getting ready for him, like those side roads had all been constructed. Finally, now the highway has been made through Jesus so that there is, there is open access There's cleansing for us to get on that road and ride it straight to the heart of God. Unrestricted access. We don't have to wait. We don't have to go through all the rituals. We don't have to send a representative of a priest to offer sacrifices that he can only see God's presence once a year to offer sacrifices for me. No, I can go straight, straight in. Why? Because Jesus has offered the final sacrifice, the full sacrifice in himself. He's taken a decisive cleansing, one that offers unrestricted access, one that will never have to be done again because the power of who he was and what he did takes care of it. You know, historically in the church, we've sung about this. Um, I'll confess to you, I've had a hard time over the last few years picking out songs that I grew up singing for us to sing as a church. Because when I read the lyrics and I think about it, I'm like, that's just messy. That's gross. It talks about things like this. There may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. There's another. Here we go. There's a fountain filled with blood. The fountain filled with blood. Sing this in church. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins, sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Now, somebody who's never been in church, doesn't know the Bible, walks in our doors, which we hope happens all the time. That's our our heart. And we sing that. Hang on with me a minute. Let me read another one. I heard an old, old story. This was my favorite growing up. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Sing about blood. What about this? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious. Precious? Is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. Think about those words that we sing or we sang growing up in church. And that we will start singing again of. Why? For the same reason that the Old Testament believers did the sacrifices to recognize how deep our sin is and what it took, what it meant for Jesus to accomplish the salvation that we need, the cleansing, the access. It's messy, and it's okay to sing of that mess because of the complexity of my sin. When we sing of the blood of Jesus, even though it may make no sense to somebody who's walking in off the street who didn't grow up in church, when we sing of that, what we're saying is that's how messy we are. Come and join us. We're so messy. Our sin is so complex and so complicated and so deep and it infected not just the stain of my own heart but the whole world that only the pouring and shedding of blood could take care of it. 
And they said, well, why aren't, you're not going to do sacrifices here this morning, are you? And we're like, no, we don't have to. Because Jesus has already come and done it. He has, he has been the ultimate sacrifice that's taken away my sin. So we don't have to sacrifice anymore because the sacrifice has been made this once and for all. It's decisive. And it grants me immediate access to my God and Father. The final sacrifice. There's a story that's told. I don't know if it's true. I know there was an earthquake in Albania. Our pastor in Georgia used to tell this story all the time. And uh, if it's not true, at least proves the point. He says there was an earthquake in Albania in 1989. That did happen. But there's a story specifically that's told because it, it destroyed so much of that, that country. And there's a story told of a father who, in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, sprinted to where his, his son was in elementary school. And the school was in just a pile of rubble when he got there. And so he immediately runs to the corner where he knows that his son's classroom was, and he starts digging and trying to pull away rock and rubble and everything else. And, you know, after hours and hours of digging, parents start to come beside him and say, hey, we're broken too, but look at it. There's no hope here. Stop, stop digging. You're, you're embarrassing yourself, and you're making it hard for us. Uh, he keeps digging. He keeps digging. Eventually, firemen come and say, hey, you're not only, you know, there's no, not only is there no hope, but there's explosions still happening all over the city where things have, you know, um, tanks and those th- kind of things were buried. And you're, you're in real danger of, of, uh, of losing your own life here. Eventually, after another set of hours, police come and say, sir, you've got to stop. And if you don't, we're going to have to force you. 12, 24, 36, and 38th hour, he finally opens and pulls away some concrete, and there's a shaft of openness, and he starts to hear the faint sound of voices down below. And he calls, <laughs> he calls out, and um, from the hole, he hears the voice of his son say, Papa, I knew you would come. I keep telling them. They told me you wouldn't, but I knew because you promised that if something ever happened, you would come for me. And I kept telling them that you would come and you're here. From the moment that Genesis 3 happened and we rebelled against God, staining our own hearts and staining the world in which we made, the Father has never stopped coming for you. He did it in the Old Testament sacrificial system in a bloody, messy way, but the way that granted some sort of access, some sort of cleansing that was real. But all of that was just in preparation for Jesus himself to come and pave the way, finish the highway straight into the heart of God so that you and I can experience that deep and final cleansing that we so desperately need and open access to the Father that's been pursuing us since the beginning of time. See, the reason sacrifice matters is because it's personal. It means something to you today, to me today, to us today. Let's don't lose that just because it's a familiar term if you grew up in church. This is not normal. This is not neat. This is not nice. But it's something that our Jesus did for us because he loves us. To complete the seeking heart of the Father to purchase us as his own. And next time he shows up, it's not to deal with sin. He's already done that. Next time he shows up, it's to take us home. Actually, to bring home to us. So whether you die and go be with him in heaven or whether he shows up first, he's coming. In the meantime, what we have is an opportunity to know him and be in a relationship with him and to make him known to those around us that are in our same situation. To tell them this good news of this once and for all sacrifice that Jesus has accomplished for us. Let's thank him for that. And let's move out to worship him this week. God, we, we, we do need you. And so often, God, we have been lulled to sleep to minimize our sin or... Um, just to accept that this is the way it is. Give us that tension this week. See things rightly, but to yearn for something more. May it point us back to you, Jesus, to 
have our hearts warmed in gratefulness for what you've done for us and to receive and rejoice in that ultimate and defining cleansing and to pursue you boldly in prayer and relationship, the walking with us, as John mentioned last week, that comes from the open access that you've gained. Encourage us, fill us with joy today even as we leave, um, and help us to help even bridge the gap from our friends and neighbors that don't know you yet. Would you, uh, would you bring them into your fold as well? We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We get a chance to respond to the preaching of God's word through the giving of our tithes and offerings and through singing of these, these song, this great song, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. So we get pre- prepared to, to give of our hearts and our our offerings, let's, uh, let's use this line to start. Um, because of the generous riches of our inheritance in Jesus, we now freely give the offerings of our hearts to you. Stand, sing with us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, he the perfect son of man, in his living, in his suffering, never trace no stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save. The hell-bound man, Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law and him we stand. From behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord. Please be seated. At this time, one of our elders, Dan Killian, is going to come to lead us in prayer.
Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, the access that you've given us, God. We truly humbled the fact that we are able to come before you today, um, not by the blood of, of bulls and goats, Lord, but by the blood of your own son shed for us, Lord. Uh, we pray that you hear our prayers today, Lord, specifically for our neighborhood and, um, and a few members of our congregation, Lord, that we're so thankful for, Lord, for, for Etta Farlow, for the Rosses and, and the Norwoods, God. God, for, for Etta, we thank you so much for her and the, and the energy and the vibrance that she brings to our church and, and our youth, Lord. Uh, we pray, Lord, for a continued um, direction, Lord, for her as she, um, you know, works through her internship, Lord, and, and looks forward to what, um, what you have in store for her, God. We pray for, for wisdom. Lord, we pray for health for her and her roommate, Lord, um, as they're dealing with a, a little bit of um, sickness, Lord, and in this time, it's so, so confusing on how to how to deal with all that, Lord. We pray, we know you're the great healer and you can um, work through that. God, we pray so much for the Rosses. We thank you um, for them and for the, all the gifts that they bring, Lord, for Daniel and Kara and Austin and Isla, Lord. We, um, there's, they bring so much joy to our church. Um, I pray, Lord, that you allow them to continue in that joy, Lord, and give them endurance and wisdom as they Continue along on this journey that you have them on, Lord, of um, raising godly children um, to know you. Lord, we pray for Austin and Isla, Lord, that they will come to know you and your son at such an early age that they'll never remember a day without you. God, we pray for David and Sarah Norwood, Lord, um, thank you so much for the gifts and the talents that they bring to our church, and uh, we're so grateful to have them here. We pray that you continue to lead them in wisdom um, as they come into um, a changing season potentially with, with work. And God, we pray that you will um, continue to give them good health and wisdom when navigating these decisions that they're going to have coming up, God. And um, especially as the holidays are coming up, Lord, with traveling, you know, still something that's a big uh, asterisk on all of our radars, God. We pray, Lord, for um, our community church, the New Sound Church, and Peter Melrose, their pastor. God, we pray that you will um, continue to use them in this community to edify and, and spread your word. Lord, we pray all these wonderful things in, in your name and for your sake. Amen. Thanks, Dan. Would you guys stand and stretch forth empty hands to receive this blessing from your God? May the relentless love of God the Father, the unending grace of Jesus Christ, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Praise God.